Hello everyone and welcome back to English 2367. This is your instructor for the course Case Whistle or KS checking in with my focus lecture for week two. Hopefully it's not coming through too much in my computer speaker um, but I'm unfortunately still just battling my way through this cold and I'm definitely super congested and just having a really tough time talking for extended periods of time. So I'm gonna do my best to try to suppress all of my coughing for when I can pause <laughs> the audio for this lecture, but I really appreciate your patience and understanding, especially that I'm getting the lecture up on Monday as opposed to Sunday, which is what I would prefer to do. Um, but unfortunately, I just am not able to speak for long periods of time. So resting my voice a lot, hoping that by next week, I will be able to speak at normal volume again, but really, really sorry that you're having to kind of listen to my crackly little voice for this lecture. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so that I can get us started with talking about this week's topic and just focus in general. All right, I'm gonna kind of shift things around on my screen really quickly. Okay, so, um, as I mentioned, this is my week two focus lecture, um, and this lecture is titled Commodified Images and Post-Traumatic Technologies. Ideally, by now, you will have engaged with all of the readings and the viewings for this week. If you've not had a chance to do so before watching this lecture, I definitely encourage you to do that first, just because what I cover here is going to make a lot more sense if you've actually completed everything for the week, as opposed to doing this and then going to look at everything. So, also just wanted to remind you, I do offer office hours each week. They are virtual via Zoom. And my office hours are Tuesdays and Thursdays from 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Eastern. And the ID and passcode for that Zoom call can be found on the first page at the top of our syllabus, All right? So let's talk a little bit about the agenda for this lecture. And as I mentioned, there will be some pauses here and there throughout the lecture so that you can cough. Um, but on your side of things, it shouldn't show up as more than a couple second gap in time. So on the agenda for today, we have five sections that we're gonna cover at varying length. Um, the first of which is from one point to the next, which is going to cover thinking about points of connection between weeks one and two. And this is particularly important for us, given that you have your first response paper due, in which you'll be thinking about how can you place the topics covered in week one in conversation with those covered for this week in week two. Um, following that section, we'll talk about recapping rhetoric or what does it mean to build and support an argument. This is a very short section of the lecture, but it is kind of synthesizing some key points from your assigned reading from So What for this week. And I really encourage you to make sure that you've skimmed or deep read that chapter before watching this portion of the lecture. Then we'll move to complex visibilities on the internet, constraints on slash of digital representation for marginalized communities. This in particular is going to be focusing on the secondary sources for this week, in particular so that I can take some time to really talk through some of the key concepts that come through in these um, sources that are gonna be particularly relevant for helping you make sense of how you can place the secondary source that you ultimately choose to work with for your highlight reel as a lens for talking about one or multiple primary sources. Then we'll talk about a multimodal movement or raising awareness through hashtag MMIWGTS, or G2S, excuse me. Um, and this is going to be something that's particularly relevant for one of the YouTube videos and all of the TikToks that you'll have watched for this week. And then finally, I'll talk through some formatting guidelines of how to, fo uh, how to follow MLA format, particularly because for the first response paper, you'll need to be aware of MLA format to ensure that you're following those formatting guidelines appropriately. So let's go ahead and begin with from one point to the next, identifying points of connection between weeks one and two. This will be a brief section, but an opportunity for me to just synthesize some key takeaways from week one to ensure that you've got them in your back pocket as we move into week two. So if you'll recall last week's theme, which I also mentioned in the overview lecture, um, was from legacy media representation to social mediated self images, visibility on what terms? And I apologize, you'll see some lighting changes. It's early in the early-ish, I should say, in the morning when I'm recording this. So of course the sun is changing outside. Um, but 
when we're talking about week one's theme, of course, one of the major takeaways I really wanted you to kind of have with you is this notion of visibility and representation as being terms that we're so often encouraged to think of as sort of bearing the most weight when it comes to achieving justice or um, you know, equality or equity in the US media scape and US society as a whole. Now, the reason why this is important for us to remember going into this week is because so often when we talk about issues of inequalities or inequities in the United States, um, there's a suggestion or an implication that if a marginalized group is able to achieve representation or visibility through mainstream media or perhaps politics or any other you know, number of sort of publicly visible um, facets of society, right? There's an impression then that sort of potentially this can be a solution that will correct long-standing, um, you know, inequities that have really existed and just been baked into the structure of the United States as a nation. And so one of the things that I want us to really have with us in this week and just kind of going forward is a healthy skepticism of how even though representation does matter and is important, it's not necessarily a corrective that's going to solve every issue that affects marginalized people and communities in the United States. And so when I use the term marginalized um, in regards to a community or a person, I'm really getting at you know, someone who has one or multiple identities that are often targeted or interpreted as being, um, you know, not kind of representative of what is interpreted as being kind of the ideal American citizen, right? So people who do have structural privilege in the US or people who sort of benefit from um, privilege for a variety of reasons often are gonna be folks who are white or who look white, um, people who are heterosexual, who are cisgender, who identify with the um, gender they were assigned at birth, people who um, have citizenship privilege, right, who were born in the United States um, and are citizens and are not undocumented or not immigrants to the U.S., um, people who benefit from being able-bodied, right, um, neurotypical or having a brain that operates in ways that are interpreted as being normal or typical, all of these different aspects of one, one's identity, right, being upper class, um, are all facets that contribute to how one navigates the world around them. And we'll talk about this throughout the semester, but just preliminarily, I want you to keep that in mind, that even though it's pretty rare that one person has every possible, you know, racial, economic um, ability, privilege, and so on, we can still recognize that each person has some aspect of their identity that likely falls into this category of having a kind of privilege. And privilege in the sense that not necessarily that it prohibits you from having any type of struggle or difficulty in your life, sorry if you can hear my cat in the background, um, but instead is you know making sure that the difficulties that you do experience aren't necessarily falling into that aspect, right? Um, and I'll kind of, like I said, elaborate more on this as we go on in the lecture, but also in general, we'll kind of talk about this since it's so core to our classes in interrogation into thinking about social media representation. And so the guiding questions I gave you for last week were, where does social media fit into mainstream media? What does representation look like in online spaces? And how do social media algorithms influence public visibility? And these are guiding questions that will continue to be important to us this week as we think more specifically about algorithms and just the possible challenges that one can face when trying to make a conversation or an image or a narrative visible to the public by way of social media as opposed to established media forms like film, television, radio, advertising, and so on. And so I want us to really be thinking about throughout the course of this class, how does social media build on existing modes of representation that we're already familiar with, right? Um, but how does it also potentially offer different opportunities for someone to be visible, especially because when we think about the existing mainstream media networks that are, or industries, I should say, that do kind of dominate the United States, many of them require this prerequisite that one has to, you know, um, achieve or successfully acquire the support of a major television network or a major record label or a major film studio that's going to sort of like something about you and feel that it can make your um, public self you know, malleable in such ways that they can really make you over into the version that they think will be most palatable to the public in the project that they're funding. And when we look at social media, we have an opportunity for people to, of course, self-represent much differently than having to appeal to a network or a studio or a label. But at the same time, the algorithms and ultimately the corporate 
um, control of those algorithms still do create a possibility in which some people's content is visible more so than others, right? And we'll kind of dive more into what that means. Now, there are sort of two quotes from your secondary sources from last week that I wanted to just hit on very briefly. And unfortunately, because my voice is really weak, I won't be able to read them out loud to you. But I have highlighted in orange text the sections that I think are particularly salient, not to suggest that these are the only argument claims or takeaways that you should be paying attention to in these sources, but just that they, I think, are very useful for kind of framing for us some of where we're moving to from last week to this week. So from the Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders on TV article, I really wanted to highlight where the authors are talking about Americans were projected to consume annually traditional and digital media for over 1.7 trillion hours, an average of approximately 15 and a half hours per person per day in 2015. And that is a lot of media and it's more than just popular entertainment, right? And they go on to say that, you know, not only is this important to think about in terms of where our attention is directed as US consumers. And of course, in the course of this class, we're gonna be focusing specifically on US media systems, though that's not to suggest that there are not other media systems globally that are also important to be attentive to. But for the purposes of this class, since we are for focusing on US identity, um, you'll see me kind of default to mentioning the US to remind us of where we're looking. But in this article, and particularly in this point that's made by the authors, I wanted to really emphasize that we may find, especially if you are someone who does not focus on popular culture or film studies or media studies more broadly as your kind of area of research or area of study in your degree, you may be kind of tempted to think, well, I find the topics of this class interesting, but they aren't necessarily important or aren't necessarily significant enough to merit so much time and attention to them. And one of the reasons I choose to assign the Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders on TV article first is that I think it does a really good job of emphasizing how so much of US consumers' time is spent with media and consuming media images that then ultimately fold into our daily lives, not only in terms of our interests and hobbies, but also in terms of how we see each other and ultimately how we see ourselves. And as I'll kind of talk about throughout the course of the semester, for example, myself as a queer Latina and a mixed race Latina at that, there were many challenges associated with watching television when I was younger and not really seeing characters or narratives that spoke to the various facets of my identity, right? Um, and so I think many folks who have one or multiple marginalized identities can really relate to this challenge of finding that even though television and film are really set up as being these spaces where we're encouraged to sort of see ourselves in the stories that are being told in US media, for many of us, there's also the kind of um, related challenge of what do you do if you don't see a um, number of narratives that actually speak to or represent the experiences that you're having when you're younger, when you're growing up, when you're an adult, and so on. And so I really invite you throughout the course of this class to reflect on, were you a person that you found that it was possible to identify with characters and relate to stories that you saw on screen throughout your entire life? Did you feel like there were a lot of options for you to connect with those stories? Or did you find that it was challenging in the sense that there were only a few characters that you felt like you could connect with because they shared one or more of your identities, right? And so I also wanted to draw attention to that this article also notes that we can really see how elite entities um, use mass media to maintain particular social group supremacy over others. And they give a useful example, I think, here of talking about how Hollywood's dominant narratives of whites as heroes and actors of colors, uh, actor of color, actors of color, oh my gosh, sorry, as sidekicks, villains, and foreigners legitimize and reproduce the racial hierarchies in US society. And I think one of the really salient examples of this is that, and this is something I study in my own work as a pop culture scholar, is that oftentimes when we see an ensemble cast where you have more than one character that's leading a show or a film, so often the main character or the primary character that we're getting the story conveyed through is a white character and then that white character's narrative is supplemented by friends of color, partners of color, other people who are not necessarily white, um, but at the same time still reinforces this idea that the story should be told first by a white character before we are invested in or care about the stories of people of color, which simply should not be the case 
But I bring this up because it is a marketing strategy used in US media to try to suggest that sort of universal stories are only those that feature white people. Additionally, when we look at the hashtag Girls Like Us article, and I mentioned, I think, in my materials for week one in a kind of um, you know, fall or spring version of this course, I have students read the full um, article, the kind of longer um, article that the authors put together um, for a journal, as opposed to kind of the shorter version that we looked at together. But I think that the shorter version for Bitch Media is a really good one in the sense that the authors are really thinking about how are they adapting their work for the popular press um, and doing so in such a way that kind of forces them in some capacity to really distill the key points and present them in a shorter form, which is something I want us to keep in mind when it comes to, you know, what does it take to convey an argument effectively? But there were two points um, from this article that I wanted to just make sure that we have in mind as we move into week two. The first of which, <coughs> excuse me, is their discussion of how, as Matthew Hines has noted, feelings of isolation are one of the most frequently recurring issues among trans people in providing a venue for a community that transcends distances through hashtag girls like us. Twitter has become a space in which this issue can be addressed as users locate other trans people, find social support and share the micro stresses of trans living. And here, I wanted to just encourage you to pay attention to how the authors go about describing what it means to create a digital space or a digital community on a platform like Twitter. And especially when we're talking about social media platforms and their affordances or what's possible to create in those spaces, we always wanna be really specific in what we mean, right? So the authors could have said something more general or broad to the effect of like, you know, black trans women use Twitter in interesting or salient ways and they talk with each other on these spaces, right? But instead of being general or broad, instead they give us specific examples of how black trans women are using Twitter, the reasons why it's so necessary to gather in a digital space and find community, particularly when we think about for um, queer and non-binary and gender non-conforming folks, right? Um, there's a way in which queer culture can sometimes be challenging to find if perhaps the hometown that you're from doesn't have a huge queer population that's out. Um, but also the fact that we don't necessarily have in the ways that we see with other types of cultures, right? There's not necessarily a guarantee that a, a queer person is going to have queer parents or, you know, queer ancestors in their family who can sort of guide them through different experiences and questions that they may have. And so a site like Twitter, as we see with this hashtag Girls Like Us movement, really provides an opportunity for community building and affinity space creation that is so necessary to sustain a feeling of just kind of inclusion and also just a feeling of like knowing that your identity is legitimate right because it can be really challenging of if you don't have other folks around you to provide that kind of um understanding or comfort or just even when really intense political moments are happening right to know that you have people you can talk to who will understand one or more experience or feeling that one may be having is another way in which I think this article is really underscoring the importance of a site like Twitter and why we shouldn't disregard it as such an important organizing and just community building tool, right? And then as another point, they also mentioned this discourse organizes a community through identity construction, encourages polyvocality through recognizing the importance of and celebrating the multiplicity of trans voices, and promotes polysemy as a means of which members of the network can create multivalent appeals to one another and to the larger public. Now, this quote in particular is one of the big reasons I wanted us to have this article in week one, in the sense that so often with mainstream media, we are encouraged as consumers of media culture to look to celebrities or stars or politicians or you know, um, heads of corporations as sort of our voices or our proxies in some way, right? As people who have that kind of larger structural power or access that therefore are gonna have an audience who is able to or willing to listen to what they have to say. And what hashtag girls like us does that I think is so interesting for our purposes in this class of thinking about what it means to make the self or make the selfie is that they're getting at the fact that one of the advantages of a hashtag movement 
is the sense that it creates the opportunity that more voices can be heard by being invited to participate in the conversation. So rather than exclusively listening to Janet Mock or exclusively listening to Laverne Cox, who of course both on their own and together are just powerhouses in terms of Black trans voices, we can really understand how this movement is opening up a space where more people, regardless of their social capital or economic access, are able to also make contributions to the discourse. And that's something I really want us to think about over the course of the semester, is how does social media create the possibility that more people than just those who have, you know, access to an audience by way of being a celebrity or being in the public eye can also create an audience through their own social media profile. Here we're gonna to move to recapping rhetoric. I'm gonna pause this really quick so that I can cough and then I will come right back. So give me one moment. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and move to recapping rhetoric or what does it mean to build and support an argument? Again, this is just gonna be a little nugget, not super long, um, but I think useful for us in terms of just synthesizing some key points that come to us from the reading. All right, so if you uh, recall from So What, they provide a really useful visual, also sorry that my cat's in the background, um, I'll try to cover her, uh, of you know, kind of thinking about imagining that an argument is a bridge between a writer and a reader. And I really like this visual because I think they do a really nice job of thinking about what it is that we're building when we're creating an argument. And for the first month of the semester, I really want you to visualize this bridge every time that you're reading a secondary source, but also engaging with the arguments presented through this, the primary sources that we're seeing in kind of video or visual form. And they mention that when we're imagining this argument as a bridge between a writer and a reader, the thesis is the roadway or the path that guides our reader. The road will not stand alone without displaying our investigation and thinking for readers to scrutinize. And we must build supports to hold the road up and rationales to link everything together. And I really, really, really want you to pay attention to the section of the chapter when you're reading, um, because I think it's a really important part of just understanding what are the various components in an argument and how do they work together to kind of in an ideal situation, leave the reader or the audience feeling compelled to accept the argument that has been presented in the sense that they feel like they see the, that this argument not only is presented by way of the thesis, but has been well supported by the um, different kind of, you know, examples or evidence or rationales that are presented by the author to their audience, right? And so we want to remember that the thesis is our argument central claim and is a debatable or controversial idea that we're proposing to our audience. And a thesis can be stated explicitly or implied. For our purposes, when we get into the second month of the semester, we're going to really work towards creating explicitly clear thesis statements. But you may find in the kind of required materials for the first month of the course that there are some examples of the implied argument. And although it often appears at the beginning of an argument, something we state our thesis most, or sometimes we state our thesis most clearly in the conclusion, because that's what a thesis really is. Is it the conclusion or the result of our investigation and thinking? And sometimes when we, we begin with a hypothesis, which is used, of course, in an experimental or scientific method, a tentative thesis that needs to be tested and validated through investigation and argumentation. And so again, we're gonna really spend some time on intro sections and conclusions when we get into the second half of the semester. But for now, as you're reading and as you're listening to arguments put forth in the primary and secondary source materials, I really want you to kind of pay attention for, can I like pull out what seems to be the thesis or the central claim made by this source? And especially kind of, I think with the response paper for this week, this will give you some opportunities to really practice some of these skills. Now, of course, underneath this section or kind of after this section in the book, there's also more discussion of what it means to support a claim. Um, and I just want to briefly mention <laughs> that a claim is going to be like once again an argumentative or debatable statement. And so it's going to be important to recognize the difference between a statement of fact and a claim, because much of our discussion this semester is going to be about pinpointing when is someone making a statement of fact and when are they making an argumentative claim that they need to support. So for example, I think a really straightforward um, statement of fact example I like to use is the sky is blue, right? Or when you look at the sky, it looks blue during the daytime. And so that is a kind of useful example of a statement of fact that everybody can agree on, right? Or um, 
another statement of fact would be the day begins with morning, right? No one's really going to argue this point unless they have a wild set of beliefs, right? Um, but they're not going to ne like not necessarily debate because everybody can kind of recognize that, yeah, okay, this is true. Shared experience, shared understanding, scientific backing, et cetera, et cetera. Now, when we're talking about a claim, it would have to be something that is argumentative or debatable, right? Um, so keeping with our kind of sky example, it could be something to the effect of um, summer skies that are pink are the most beautiful, right? Pretty low stakes in terms of an argument. It's not necessarily something that realistically is going to get people really, you know, toasty to argue over, but it's an example of an argumentative claim because it's something that could be debated or could be argued over because someone else might say, no, I think summer, you know, skies that are rainy are the best, or I think those that are blue with clouds, et cetera, et cetera, right? Another example of maybe an argumentative claim might be, um, I think one that's really big on the internet right now is the new, um, you know, and newest installment in the MCU gave us a really conflicting depiction of Wanda Maximoff compared to WandaVision, right? Um, that would be an argumentative claim because people could debate over how is the portrayal of Wanda Maximoff or the Scarlet Witch in the, you know, Doctor Strange movie, maybe at odds with how she was portrayed in the WandaVision series on Disney Plus, right? So this, I think, would then be um, clear as a claim as opposed to a statement of fact if for example the statement of fact was um wanda maximoff has a lot of power we could all agree that that's the case right if you are engaged with the mcu at all now when we talk about a claim versus support a support is going to be where you really need to kind of follow through on the claim that you've made by demonstrating how you're arriving at this claim so for example um you know if we're thinking still about um the sky example, just to kind of keep this section short, and you make the argument, my argumentative claim of like the you know summer skies that are pink are the most beautiful. A support would need to be something to the effect of perhaps like you know when it's pink outside, the way that flowers look are especially gorgeous. I don't know, or with the MCU example, you know the argumentative claim of like you know the latest installment of the MCU gives us a perhaps odd or um, obnoxious or bothersome portrayal of Wanda Maximoff um, compared to WandaVision, then you would need some kind of support that clarifies or demonstrates how the way that Wanda is portrayed in WandaVision is perhaps preferable or um, more nuanced than how she's portrayed in the latest Doctor Strange movie. Hopefully this makes sense. We'll expand on this, of course, throughout the course of the semester, but these are key points that I really want you to be attentive to as you're reading the chapter for this week, or ideally have read the chapter for this week already. There's also a way um, that this section um, kind of gets into evidence and verification um, and illustrations um, that I think is also useful for our purposes as well. Um, I encourage you to kind of be attentive to these sections. I think kind of the most useful to pay attention to would be where they explain the difference between a primary source and a secondary source, since that, of course, is language that we're using at throughout the course of the semester. Um, but I think otherwise, you know, just being attentive to this language, since we will come back to it, will be important. Here we're going to switch to complex visibilities on the internet, constraints on slash of digital representation for marginalized communities. I'm going to pause to cough and blow my nose, and then I will be right back. All right, so let's go ahead and dive into complex visibilities on the internet, constraints on slash of digital representation for marginalized communities. So I wanted to start by pulling a quote from the Kelly Middlebrook piece, The Gray Area, which you are reading for this week. Um, and I especially want to kind of highlight and draw your attention to where she defines the term shadow banning, which is going to be so crucial to our inquiries for this week. And also I think is going to be relevant for thinking about when we're talking about the importance and emphasis that's placed on visibility and representation, especially for marginalized groups, how is there also a challenge of achieving visibility or representation on the internet because of um, issues such as shadow banning. And so she defines shadow banning as being, you know, a situation in which um, 
you know, there's the partial censorship of online accounts without the knowledge or consent of the user and is one form of algorithmic censorship. And so when, again, when we're thinking about this term of algorithm, we're talking about the um, ways that social media platforms are designed online so that, to create a user interface that we're all able to engage with, right? But as Middlebrook is getting at, there can be a form of censorship enacted through these algorithms when content that's uploaded by various users is not made visible in the same ways. And so she goes on to explain that examples of shadow banning on Instagram include rendering a user's hashtags undiscoverable, restricting account visibility to followers only, as opposed to the broader Instagram community, preventing the account handle from auto-populating in the search bar, or filtering posts out of the feeds of followers. So again, similar to the hashtag girls like us article, where the authors are giving us key examples of what they mean when they talk about a digital community forming through the hashtag girls like us movement, Middlebrook is also giving us key examples of what she means when she's arguing or making the argumentative claim that someone can experience algorithmic censorship when they are shadow banned on the platform. And so she goes on to say, it's important to note, though, that from the account owner's perspective, nothing has changed. This form of censorship is typically only noticed after its effects have been felt by observing a drop in comments, likes, and views. And so one of the challenges with shadow banning is it's almost like trying to catch air in the sense that you know that it's there, but you can't grab hold of it very tangibly because it's difficult to prove that it's there um, in a more casual sense, right? And so by that, I mean that one of the challenges for marginalized creators, which Callie Middlebrook gets into detail of in her essay or in her paper, is that people can see changes eventually on their platform or on their profile in the sense that they're no longer seeing the same amount of likes, views, and comments that they typically had before, right? But the challenge is, is that they only notice the problem is happening after that effect has really taken place. So after there's been a hit to their online presence, do they actually start to sense like something seems awry here compared to kind of how my you know online presence was operating prior to this? We've also seen YouTubers talk about this as well, but for now I wanted to kind of present the middle brook because I think she does a nice way of succinctly talking about shadow banning in a way that gives us a sense of sort of what the issue is and the harms that can be enacted by this issue in the sense of if visibility is considered so important to us, then how does the risk of not achieving visibility because of shadow banning reveal a kind of structural censorship that can happen to marginalized creators? An article we didn't read for this class, but I think kind of is a useful companion piece is by Jessalyn Cook titled, Instagram CEO says shadow banning is not a thing. That's not true. And it was published by HuffPost in 2020. And I pulled this because in Jessalyn Cook's piece, um, it goes on to say, Instagram acknowledges, however, that it hides public posts it deems to be inappropriate, but that doesn't, that, but that don't actually violate any guidelines from its explore and hashtag pages. It does this without alerting affected users who are often left to wonder why their content's engagement is lower than usual. The objective here, Instagram says, is to prevent the promotion of potentially unsafe posts, but the company has yet to explain how it defines inappropriate or to give users even a vague idea instead threatening to secretly curtail their visibility should they fail to follow an undefined rule. In other words, selective shadow banning is written into Instagram's rule book. So what I want you to really pay attention to when looking at the Middlebrook essay that you've ideally already read before watching this lecture is really pay attention to where she's getting into this issue of community guidelines that are created by Instagram. And I want you to especially be thinking about the ambiguity or the ambiguous language that is so often used by corporations in their terms of service or terms and conditions of use. Now, if you'll recall, I kind of mentioned this in a previous lecture in the sense that when we're talking about algorithms and the way that we navigate social media platforms, there's this idea, right, that we have to click a, yes, I have read and agreed to the terms of service to utilize these platforms that are otherwise free to us we'll get into later kind of why there's some challenges with that. But one of the things that we want to be mindful of or take notice of is how platforms, and this is of course not specific only to social media and it can extend beyond it and does, but how their guidelines or their community guidelines in particular suggest that a platform like Instagram wants to be protective of 
or really um, selective in the content that they allow on the platform to protect the community that they're creating. But at the same time, what's deemed appropriate or safe or family friendly is oftentimes homophobic, transphobic, right, anti-Black. And these policies will oftentimes um, set up a kind of precedent or idea that content created by white creators is somehow the safest or sort of most universal, going back to the Asian American and Pacific Islanders on TV article, the idea that sort of white characters and white protagonists are the most relatable to everyone in the world, right? There's also an issue in a platform like Instagram of the implication that cisgender, heterosexual, white creators, able-bodied creators, and so on, are going to produce content that is the least offensive, least inappropriate, so on and so forth. And now, one of the reasons I kind of bring this up is to say that there are a lot of challenges associated with this when the sense that one's own body or one's own existence or identity is deemed inappropriate or kind of regulated as inappropriate by Instagram's algorithm in such a way that Middlebrook goes on to explain a bit more than I am here, um, creates some challenges then that someone's content is then effectively prevented from, from being seen by the public. And we see this issue, I think, really interestingly come up in Kara Rosea's TikTok. Um, she is the creator on the right side of the screen whose TikTok he watched in regards to the shadow banning of the missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit movement that happened um, last year um, and in 2020 as well. We really have seen um, a shadow banning of content created by Indigenous creators on TikTok and on Instagram. And Kara Rose is talking about TikTok, though, of course, there's some kind of similarities between TikTok and Instagram in this regard of shadow banning. But I wanted to kind of show a bit of a um, opposite situation that's happening here. So whereas, as I'll expand on in, in a later section of this lecture, where you see, um, of course, that um, content by Indigenous creators is being shadow banned so that their coverage of or discussion of you know, the ways that missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit folks are not, are kind of continue to be lost from view to the public. At the same time, as the um, Unpacking the Racism of Digital Blackface in the Information Age video that you looked at, which is screenshotted on the left side of the screen, that particular video shows kind of the opposite effect of what is hyper-visible on platforms like TikTok, right? So digital blackface and how it really permeates many different spaces on the internet. And I think it's really interesting to kind of place then in contrast the ways that whereas digital blackface is really um, pervasive on the internet, at the same time, cre uh, content created by Indigenous creators, by Black creators, um, is then effectively shadow banned. Um, and as the Cali Middlebrook essay gets at, right, um, content created by marginalized creators at large is really shadow banned and prevented from view. And yet the video from The Root kind of shows how content created by white creators that is offensive and it's um, kind of, what's the verb I'm looking for here? Like um, the way that it perpetuates digital blackface, right, is allowed to really permeate these sites and is allowed to continue to circulate on the internet and can ultimately also result in the creation of white creators brands that become very popular and perhaps afford them opportunities even beyond social media. And that's an issue we'll really talk about in week four when we talk about self-branding um, through the internet. I also wanted to pull a couple of screenshots from the root video that I think are important. Um, there's of course discussion of how digital blackface is when non-black people attempt to recreate blackness online. And the video does a really nice job of showing kind of how digital blackface is not only a term that we're indebted to um, from Lauren Michelle Jackson, who is a black media scholar who wrote the article, we need to talk about digital blackface and reaction gifs or gifs, depending on how you pronounce that, um, on Teed Vogue in 2017. Um, I normally teach this article in the, in the um, fall or spring version of this course, but again, I try to really be thoughtful about the fact that this is an accelerated course and we don't have the same amount of time to read everything. But if you are interested in reading it, it's very short and very, very good. But it's been a very foundational piece um, for how people talk about digital blackface and use this term that she presents on the internet and in regards to internet studies. But something I wanted to flag here is that the video also, of course, mentions how digital blackface has some roots in um, blackface and minstrelsy, minstrelsy shows 
um, of the 19th century. And as I mentioned previously, it's really important for us as you know, folks who are interrogating US popular culture in this class, be aware of how blackface is a foundational root of various issues in US popular culture and how pervasive of an image uh, blackface and minstrelsy shows have been in US popular culture and US media. But I also just really wanted to flag that, you know, with the digital blackface and with blackface and minstrelsy shows, I really wanted to stress, which I'm not sure if it totally came through in the video, and just wanted to really drive this point home. With digital blackface and with blackface and, you know, minstrelsy performances, these are deeply offensive caricatures and performances created by non-Black creators. And these creators are doing this work in such a way that they're taking their assumptions and their projections of Blackness and caricaturing it and making a joke out of it in their content. And so by this, I mean that it's not, it's so one of the challenges with Blackface is that it's presenting stereotypes of and um, kind of false portrayals of Black people in the content and implying that this is accurate to Black folks, Black American folks, African American folks as experiences and identities, which is not the case, right? And so I want us to be really clear on this point that Blackface is in part offensive because it's implying or suggesting that stereotypes about Black people that have been in circulation for more than 100 years are factual when they are not factual. And in addition to that, there's a really offensive way in which non-Black performers or creators, depending on what word you want to use here, depending on the decade or time frame, again, are building their careers off of making jokes of and making caricatures of Black folks, but also attempting to sort of own Blackness by way of their performance, by implying or suggesting that Blackness is something that is malleable and can be owned by non-Black people in their content and can be ways that they can really advance their public image um, as a source of comedy, right? A source of entertainment. And so we really want to be noticing how platforms like TikTok, which we'll come back to in week four, given that it has the user interface format of encouraging creators to copy each other, of course, through trending sounds, through dance challenges and so on, there creates a really um, tense environment in which you do see many non-Black creators appropriate um, the sounds and dances and, and creative labor of Black creators on the platform, but often so do so in a way that's out of proportion to the situation. And so what Lauren Michelle Jackson really gets at in her article that I think is sort of well conveyed by this video is that with Blackface minstrelsy shows and performances, and now with digital Blackface, it's the kind of consistent pattern by which non-Black people appropriate and use Blackness and Black people's likeness or image in a way to express emotion or express um, a narrative that allows them to kind of exaggerate themselves beyond how they normally behave or perhaps to sort of utilize sounds or images of Black people to try to act cool or act different than they are. And so I want you as you're on TikTok and even just as you watched this video to reflect on the ways that this is deeply offensive that Black people, especially we see this and it's covered in the video, you know, whether it's Black women on Real Housewives or just um, Black celebrities in general um, get their image and their likeness gets co-opted by non-Black people and made fun of as a source of exaggeration, as a way that white non-Black people can really cash in on using Blackness as a way to look cool or to make fun of it or to further stereotypes of Blackness and in fact are projecting their own meaning onto Black identity that is not factual, not consistent with what Black identity is in terms of its nuances and its many histories. Now, one of the articles that you looked at for this week is by Safiya Umoja Noble, who's an associate professor of gender studies and Afri African American studies at UCLA. And she's also the co-founder and co-director of the UCLA Center for Critical Internet Inquiry. I wanted to just kind of briefly pull some information about Umoja Noble because we are looking at a longer piece from her, um, <coughs> excuse me, but also because her, her um, wider breadth of work is really focused on understanding internet culture, surveillance on the internet, how algorithms really tell us um, who is valued and who is not, right? But also how 
internet um, search engines by way of like Google in particular, really further harmful narratives about women of color and girls of color in particular. Now, a book that she's known for is Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism. And sometimes when I've taught this course, students have decided to use one chapter or parts of this book as part of their source um, material that they're utilizing for the final project. And so I felt that it was useful to kind of mention it here. But I also wanted to mention how what we looked at for today is really in conversation with this larger work of hers. It's not from this work, but it's in conversation. And in Algorithms of Oppression, Noble argues that search engines are not neutral spaces or disconnected from larger structural oppression. And this book was published in 2018 by New York University Press. And the topics covered in this monograph are the single authored um, scholarly book length inquiry include corporate control over public information, how Google search reinforces stereotypes, non-commercial search engines and information portals, information system regulation, techno technology monopolies, and public policy. And she's really interested in the relationship between technology and public policy, particularly because we can really glean a lot of understanding about how tech and the kind of images that we upload to the internet, but also the ways that Im images and narratives are uploaded to represent us without our consent are so crucial to understanding how identity is you know, developed and functions in the 21st century. And so for someone like Sophia Umoja Noble, we actually have to start with focusing on the internet search engines that we use on platforms like Safari or Google Chrome, right, um, or Firefox, um, to really think about how it is even just the root of the search engine contains issues as, issues as well in the algorithm that move beyond just looking at social media platforms that we ultimately arrive at through first navigating internet search engines. Um, before I move on, I'm gonna pause the cough and then you'll see me back here in a few moments. All right, I am back. <laughs> um, so one of the terms that she offers in Algorithms of Oppression is technological redlining. It's not covered in the article that we looked at for this week, but I do think it's an important companion term just to kind of move forward with this week. So she describes technological redlining as how search, in, or search algorithms reinforce oppressive social relationships and enact new modes of racial profiling, evidenced by how racism and sexism are embedded in their coding, for example, in top search results. And so something that's important to consider here is that algorithms are designed by people and people carry biases with them. And so what she's really getting at here is that we can't assume that a machine doesn't hold the bias of the creator simply because it's a machine. Rather, the bias that the creator holds will find its way into the system unless you have a more kind of careful attention to ensuring that this does not happen. And so she makes the point that typically the practice of redlining has been most often used in real estate and banking circles, creating and deepening inequalities by race such that, for example, people of color are more likely to pay higher interest rates or premiums just because they are Black or Latino, especially if they live in low-income neighborhoods. On the internet and in our everyday uses of technology, discrimination is also embedded in computer code and increasingly in artificial intelligence technologies that we are reliant on by choice or not. And so Sophia Umoja Noble, as an internet studies scholar, is really driving home the point that we can see, of course, historical and economic precedents by which Black and Latino communities, these are not the only ones, but she highlights them here, are communities have, who have really been economically affected by discriminatory policies that have really reduced the opportunities or options at which they can sort of qualify for a loan, can move into a neighborhood, right? And so she's making a point of connection that we can really see how the internet furthers the discrimination targeted at or structural discrimination targeted at Black and Latino communities by way of how search engines are designed to kind of continue to separate them out from white uh, people and communities as being different or other. Now, she also mentions that, you know, in a, a video that kind of goes into some of her research that we didn't watch for today, but I think is also useful as a companion, that it's important for the public, particularly people who are marginalized, or again, people who experience, you know, discrimination um, based on one or multiple of their identities, 
such as women and girls and people of color to be critical of the results that purport to represent them in the first 10 to 20 results in a commercial search engine. They do not have the economic, political, and social capital to withstand the consequences of misrepresentation. If one holds a lot of power, one can withstand or buffer misrepresentation at a group level and often at the individual level. And so, and this also kind of, I pull some of this also from algorithms of oppression itself, but what she's getting at here is that those who do not have structural power and who are represented on behalf of, right, um, by spaces like internet search engines don't have the sort of social or economic capital necessary to intervene on those misrepresentations and then are faced with a situation in which those misrepresentations of them, whether they be negative or stereotypes or just, you know, from an outside perspective that are not accurate to how that identity or community actually exists, right? Um, they're facing the consequences of these false narratives in their day-to-day -day life. And so I wanted to include this just as kind of like a, um, um, uh, sorry, my brain, um, it's just kind of a, a backing to think about of what are the issues or the harms enacted by having representation that's done on your behalf that you don't elect to or that you weren't participating in and how that can create a situation in which people make assumptions about you. Um, for women, for example, that can look like hypersexualization, criminalization, um, lack of personhood. There's a number of different things that can happen that can be very scary in both abstract and in literal senses. <laughs> and so in the article that we did look at for today, she really focuses on what are the harms enacted by the internet for Black and Black American folks who are navigating these search engines and these algorithms in spaces when kind of violence has been enacted on Black folks in day-to-day -day life or the real world. So for example, she's really thinking about the ways in which um, there's a complex layering of silences, the silences of those who cannot control the ways in which they are represented at the level of group identity, so victims and their families, for example, the silences of the overwhelming majority of people who are unaware of the ways in which they are represented and how this may shape public opinion and the silences of the companies who do not engage with the civic impact of the ways in which they profit from the media spectacle of Black people dead and dying. I want to pause here to say, I mentioned this in my last lecture, but I encourage you to think back to, if it feels safe to do so, um, the uprisings that took place in 2020 and the ways that the images of George Floyd were circulated on the internet. Now, this article by Sophia Umojinobo was published in 2018 and precedes 2020, of course, but I want you to really notice um, and think back to your own reading experience of this article, the ways that what she's talking about remain contemporaneous to the issues that we face in 2022, by which I mean the ways in which when a Black person is murdered by the police, is murdered by a, you know, racist shooter, right? Many different ways that we've seen Black death happen, um, like recently, even just historically as well, if we think about Emmett Till or Rodney King, um, though in Rodney King's case, right, there were sort of uh, differences in terms of the circulation of him being beaten by the police. All of this is to say that when we think about the kind of spectacle that's created around folks in states of Black, or Black folks in states of death and dying, or just even being abused on the street, the way that those images and videos are then published to the internet and circulate around the internet and become memes or become gifts or become challenges, whatever it might be, is something that we really want to problematize and consider the harm that's created. And this multifaceted harm also meaning the sense that, you know, considering that many of the, these images and videos that are circulated don't come with content warnings. So the possibility that someone clicks on someone else's Instagram story or TikTok and is all of a sudden exposed to seeing a horrific image or a horrific video that they did not consent to see and didn't know was coming. I, a lot of what Noble is getting at here is the real trauma that then is experienced by Black folks and African American folks of being faced with these images and videos over and over and over without warning. And the idea or the um, belief that's held by many non-Black people, for example, but also potentially some Black folks, of the idea that by documenting these, these images of Black folks in states of death and dying and recording and uploading these to the internet will result in some kind of judicial justice, which is not necessarily the case. And so Sophia Mojanobu is really asking us to sit with 
the belief that we may hold that by way of recording these images, there's an assumption that justice will be achieved. And in fact, the you know victim or survivor's family or loved ones are not getting consulted when these images are uploaded to the internet. And so she makes this argument that we really need to challenge the notion that surveillance footage can be a means of change when the prevailing spectacle is one of profiting from the pain of Black people with no remedy or restitution or reparation. And we can also think about, of course, examples of this also extending to the 24-hour news cycle and the ways that news channels also really kind of traffic in showing images of Black folks in states of death and dying and air these on you know, network, uh, network television without any regard for how this really affects kind of the um, victim or, survivals, or survivors, loved ones or family. And so I also kind of include this quote here that I'll keep at a minimum. I'm sorry if you can hear my cat in the background. Um, but Noble also makes this point. It's here that the basis of community control over images and identity is under threat in an unregulated technology sector that affords little rights to the subject, their families, or their communities in the circulation and narrative surrounding digital images. So again, thinking about, and I want you to kind of keep this in mind going forward, when we upload something to the internet, who owns it? And ultimately, when it comes to these traumatic or traumatizing images, um, how do these images then become fodder or commodified that corporations profit off of the engagement that then is attributed to it by people who are engaging in horrific ways, in sad ways, in concerned ways, and so on and so forth. Here I'm going to transition us to a multimodal movement, raising awareness through hashtag MMIWG2S, but I'm going to pause to cough and then I will come right back. All right, so here we're going to transition to a multimodal movement, raising awareness through hashtag MMIWG2S. And this is going to really cover the remaining videos that you had for this week, both in terms of the TikToks and one of the YouTube videos. And I'll move relatively quickly through this section, um, but I want to hit on some key points. So MMIW stands for Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, and the term is also used as MMIWG, or Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. It's also used as MMIWG2S, or Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls, and Two-Spirit People. And you'll kind of see variations of which of these terms are used, but they're all really kind of getting at a similar argumentative claim. And now in Christian Allaire's How Red Dresses Became a Symbol or Become a Symbol piece for Vogue in 2021, which we didn't read for this class, but I think is a useful companion, he notes that in North America, the scores of missing and murdered Indigenous women, known as MMIW, an acronym created by Indigenous journalist Sheila North Wilson in 2012, don't get the mainstream attention they deserve. In the US, homicide is the third leading cause of death among Native women ages 10 to 24, according to the Urban Indian Health Institute, and Native women are victims of murder more than 10 times the national average, according to the US Department of Justice. In Canada, the government's national inquiry found similar horrifying statistics, including that Indigenous women are seven times more likely to be murdered by serial killers than non-Indigenous women. And I think Christian Allaire's point here is really important for setting the, and establishing the context for why the MMIWG2S movement is so important and how the ways that this movement continues to be overshadowed is furthering the harm already enacted by the physical harms that Indigenous women experience in the U.S. and in Canada. Um, Kiara Alfon Alfonseca writes, as Deb Haaland creates a uni unit to investigate missing and murdered Native Americans, a look at why it's necessary for ABC News in 2021, um, she provides some additional context of Colleen Medicine, Program director at the Association on American Indian Affairs agrees. She said she believes the missing data is a large part of the issue and is affecting the help needed to heal this community. Our people go missing three times over. The first time is physically. They're physically stolen, abducted, taken, murdered. Then they're missing in the data. The third time is they're not home with their families. They're not home in their communities, Medicine said. That's why we have to be our own advocates. This point is extremely important and I think adds some additional layers to what's discussed in the Huffington Post video that you watched for today. And I want you to really pay attention to this point made by Colleen Medicine of our people go missing three times over. When we're thinking about erasure as a term that we've already engaged with in week one, it's applicable here, but also kind of this 
quote helps us to really understand that when we're talking about representation thus far we've really focused on you know film television radio but we haven't necessarily talked about what it means to be erased or missing in government data pertaining to missing and murdered women girls and two spirit people right so in one of the videos i asked you to watch for today um it follows the work of Anita Lucchese, who's a doctoral intern at the Urban Indian Health Institute, and Anita is of Southern Cheyenne descent. And I want you to, as you reflect on your process of watching this video, think back to where in this video Anita's personal narrative is shared with the viewer, especially as kind of thinking about what was her point of entry into doing this work with the Urban Indian Health Institute, and especially how her role as a researcher and an intern is informed by her own personal narrative and life experience and how that personal narrative and life experience is represented in the video to help tell the origin story of how she started kind of documenting or trying to document the absences of indigenous women, girls and true spirit folks in the police data of missing and murdered people. Now she creates these maps that we get a few examples of in the video, one of which is this one of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls in Southwest cities. And we also have this one of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls in Alaskan cities. And I encourage you to pause to look at them to really think of the construction of these maps that are presented by Lucchese. And I want you to also think about once again, how representation is talked about in this video that's a bit different than how we've talked about representation thus far in terms of what it means to be visible or represented. This is especially important, I think, that in the age that we see so much public attention around true crime and just kind of um, serial killers and just so much energy associated with kind of crime as a form of entertainment, whether fictitious or true crime, there's a way in which Lucchese's work here is really getting at the fact that there is such an absence of indigenous voices in these spaces um, that kind of furthers the harm that already exists by way of the fact that we don't see a kind of careful record keeping of which indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit folks are missing and murdered. And what does that mean in terms of the families and loved ones who kind of similarly to um, Sophia Umoja Noble's piece about you know, Black American and Black folks being um, or kind of experiencing or facing structural harm and violence, right? How is there a kind of point of connection then between these texts for this week of thinking about the harms that are enacted on Indigenous communities and Black and Black American and Afro-Indigenous communities by way of kind of, you know, um, U.S. infrastructures that fail to ultimately consult the families and loved ones and find ways to um, just kind of consider the fact that um, so many of the, so much of the discourse, I should say, that focuses on missing children, on murdered folks, is centered around bringing white children or missing or murdered white women home. And again, this is not to suggest that we should not care about or should not be invested in bringing um, white women or white children home, right? But the, the point being made in this particular video is that we do see kind of disproportionate resources allocated for investigating missing and murdered white women and children. Um, we saw this particularly with the recent Gabby Petito case, right? That just kind of the government and local and regional resources that are allocated for investigating one missing white woman is so different compared to one missing indigenous woman, right? <laughs> excuse me. Um, and then we see kind of the ways that the video goes on to provide us with some data or kind of the um, issues that really permeate the erasures and absences of Indigenous folks in the system. And the video also mentions that, you know, Indigenous folks are incarcerated at rates 38% higher than the national average. And so when we think back to terms like overrepresentation and underrepresentation given to us by, video, by um, texts such as the Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders on TV article, we can really see how the term overrepresentation would be relevant to apply here when talking about the judicial system. And so again, Native people are overrepresented in the prison system or prison population, but missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two-spirit folks are underrepresented in police records and missing person databases. And as the HuffPost video states, while law, while law enforcement might be slow to protect Native people, they aren't slow when it comes to prosecuting them. And so this is a major issue then when it comes to 
if we're talking about representation and visibility as being a potential corrective to issues that exist in the United States, overrepresentation in the prison system and underrepresentation in police records and missing person databases isn't necessarily achieving what it is that indigenous co communities need in order to arrive at justice and honestly to get answers for families and loved ones affected by the MMIWG2S movement. I've included also for you here in case throughout the time that I've been speaking, if you've never heard the term two spirit or you're unfamiliar with it, I've provided a video that does a really nice job of explaining what this term means. Um, there's very, many varied uses of two spirit within various indigenous communities because once again, indigenous communities are not a monolith, they're not homogenous, there are many different indigenous identities. Um, and so I wanna make sure that we're really attentive to this and acknowledging this. And so I really ask that you independently watch this video because if I play it for you, I'll get a copyright slap on my um, YouTube video. And so I ask that you watch this separately because I think it does a great job of explaining some of the histories of this term. Um, I'm going to try to click this without turning on sound. So apologies if there's some awkward noise. Oops, okay. Um, we also get some discussion um, in the HuffPost video of local jurisdictions very often um, they tell us, well, you have an individual story, right? Yet there's no data to say this is an epidemic. And once again, I really want to emphasize here this issue of representation and how data and specifically government data can be an example of a space by which a community um, or a um, identity is underrepresented and therefore perceived of as being either not recognized as valid people, right, or recognized or not, or there's not sort of a government recognition of a larger issue, despite the many activists and folks who are mobilizing around this issue. I've included here as well the link to read the full report of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, if this is something that you're interested in looking into further, but I have also pulled some of the key points for you here. And so this report tells us, and it's a 2017 report by the Urban Indian Health Institute, um, that more than 95% of the cases in this study were never covered by national or international media. 5,712 cases of MMIWG were reported in 2016, and only 116 of them were logged in the Department of Justice database. 506 MMIWG cases were identified across 71 selected urban cities. 128 were cases of missing Indigenous women, 280 were cases of murdered Indigenous women, 98 were cases with an unknown status, and 29 was the median age of MMIW, uh, MMIWG victims. Um, and there's kind of more discussion here also of the ribbon skirt that's shown, shown on the right side of the screen as a form of cultural clothing that represents the sacredness of American Indian and Alaska Native women and the deep connection that their bodies and spirits have to the land. And it kind of goes on about the importance of this image. But I wanted to just kind of include some of these statistics, not only because I think they're important for making sure that our understanding of this issue is well-rounded, but also to really challenge the fact that if this is the first time that they, you're hearing of the MMIWG2S movement, that really speaks to this larger issue that there continues to be an erasure and silencing and sort of underrepresentation of the cases of missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two spirit folks in the US and Canada. And it's important that we really are attentive to learning more about this issue um, to also really challenge the ways in which, again, um, narratives about and, you know, content created around crime, true crime, fictional crime, really do not do its due justice to cover the many cases of missing Indigenous folks that um, continue to be unsolved and unanswered. I also have pulled some other um, kind of, um, <laughs> excuse me, excerpts from the report that indicate that due to Urban Indian Health Institute's limited resources and the poor data collection by numerous cities, the 506 cases identified in this report are likely an undercount of missing and murdered indigenous women and girls in urban areas. And I want us to really think about that. Similarly to how rape is the most underreported crime in the United States, we also can see a mention here in this report of the fact that we have an underrepresentation of the actual number of cases of how many indigenous women's, women, girls, and two-spirit folks are missing um, or murdered because of the fact that the data is not accurate 
to have the amount that one needs in order to really kind of cover the full, um, the kind of full range or scope of this issue. I also include here, you'll kind of see um, sometimes on social media, um, coverage of Red Dress Day um, and kind of what it is, is in terms of really drawing attention to the missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls, and two spirit folks who remain, whose cases remain unsolved um, and also just continue to be um, overlooked by public um, institutions. And so I've included some graphics here that you can look at that provide some additional context that I think is important as well to keep in mind. Um, you will also maybe have noticed in the TikToks that we watched for this class that there was a song in the background. And this song is called Remember Me by Fawn Wood, who's playing Cree Salish. And this song is dedicated to missing and murdered Indigenous women. If you're able to view the slides separate from watching my lecture, I encourage you to do so to listen to the song in full. Um, but this song really became associated with the MMIWG2S movement and is one that is included in um, this um, <laughs> excuse me, sorry, that's included in this kind of TikTok um, movement to increase visibility as a way to kind of both sonically and visually showcase the importance of drawing public attention to MMIWG2S cases. Oops, oh no. So I wanted to make sure that I didn't get a copyright strike. Um, okay, and then the three creators that you had for the TikTok, sorry that my voice is failing, um, we have Nirtuli Wilkins, who's a queer Diné and Lumbe creator, um, Shaina Novalinga, um, who's Inuit, and um, Kara Roseas, who's Chabaquitic Wampanoag and Black and identifies as Afro-Indigenous, and I've provided some additional information about them as creators here. I've also uh, included on the next slide information about Shaina, who is a model, um, and is modeled for um, companies like Sephora, um, in case you're interested in kind of learning more about her as a creator. <clears throat> Unfortunately, because of my voice, I'm not able to sort of expand on this point as much as I would like to. All right, so here I'm going to transition us to formatting guidelines, but I'm going to very briefly cough and blow my nose, and then I will be right back. And again, thank you so much for your patience with me being just a sickly little thing. All right, I'm back with a little red nose, but I'm back. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to talk very quickly about formatting guidelines or how to follow MLA format. <clears throat> it's pretty straightforward, but the reason that I'm including it in this lecture, and hopefully you can return back to this throughout the semester, is that you will notice on the prompt for response paper one, which I cover in depth in this week's overview lecture, that there are formatting requirements that you're expected to follow. And um, of course, this kind of provides you once again with the rundown of what those are. I'm not going to talk about them exhaustively here, but I've included them again here for your reference. However, in case in the event, that you're like, I've never used MLA format, or I don't remember what it is, or just quite frankly, I'm nervous that I'm going to mess something up. I have included a slide by slide breakdown of what every aspect of document formatting is going to really refer to when you're talking about following MLA format. So the documents formatting refers to the header, margins, page numbers, spacing, title, font type, and font size, which should be consistent throughout the document, except for the header, which only appears on the first page. Okay. Now the header is gonna be the information on who is writing the paper, what course they're writing it for, when they're writing and submitting it, and who the professor is. So I've provided an example of what that looks like on the right side of the screen. It should be your first name and last name, my name, the name of the course, and then the, the um, day, month, and year. Um, you'll notice, of course, the examples I have here are a little old. I have not updated these materials for some time, so they're not going to be, you know, for 2367 in terms of like in the header, but it's the same information that you need to follow. Um, I want to really emphasize a couple things. Do not write the header in the header section on Word. It's very confusing, but if you type it in in the header uh, section on the page, it will appear on every page of your document, and you do not want that. Um, instead, you're going to type this header with, within your margins. That way it only appears on that first page, okay? I also ask that you spell my name right. Um, I know that getting names right can be tricky, but it's really important, especially, you know, my name is a mixture of English and Spanish, and it's important to me that my name is spelled correctly um, to honor who I am as a person. 
I, like I said, because I go by KS, K-Swizzle, Instructor Sweeney Romero, or Professor Sweeney Romero, it's fine if you use any configuration of those. Just please make sure that you spell whichever one that you're using correctly. If you're nervous and you're like, I don't feel confident that I'm going to get the spelling right, you can write KS and I will not be offended. Just make sure that my name is written correctly, whichever configuration you use, okay? Um, and so I, I provide some further explanations on where to type the header uh, on the left side of the screen. <laughs> Your margins, which should be familiar to you, are the borders of the page that contain where the central information is located. You should always be working with one inch margins. There might be the possibility that your document is preset to have 1.25 inch margins. Please check them. I read enough papers that I can tell when it's not one inch margins. Um, so please double check in Google Docs or on Word that you have the appropriate margins set up. They should be one inch all the way around. Your page number should also appear in the top right corner of your page. And this number indicates what page information is occurring in. And this is helpful when a paper is being reviewed by a peer or professor in that they can easily refer back to a note that they made. You'll also notice that when you are referencing a secondary source, you'll need the page number to identify where the information or quotation is coming from. And so similarly, you wanna make sure that you have page numbers on each page of your assignments um, that are traditional essays to ensure that when someone is giving you feedback, they remember where they've been. Sorry that my cat is um, sunbathing next to us. <laughs> um, so I've provided some information on the left side of the screen, instructing you on how you can set up page numbers in Word or in Google Docs. Spacing is one that I'm a little picky about. So in MLA format, all paragraphs should be double spaced, not single or 1.5 spaced. There should not be any excess space between paragraphs. The way you can tell if there is excess spacing between your paragraphs is you'll want to go to Word or Docs and look under format and paragraph to see with spacing. I'll try to use my cursor to show you. So here where it says line spacing, right? But specifically when it says before and after, that should say zero point. If it does not say zero point, that means there's going to be extra space in between your paragraphs. And you're going to get a grumpy little comment from me saying, why is there extra spacing between your paragraphs? It's a way sometimes students will try to meet the, the page count by having extra spacing in between, but it makes me grumpy. So please double check your presets uh, for spacing on Google Docs or Word to make sure that you don't have extra space in the preset. Um, and also, if you're doing it consciously, please don't. The title. Um, the title of your essay should indicate what you are writing about. This title should be specific and focus on a theme or issue on the paper uh, or of the paper that is being analyzed. It should not be general or the name of the assignment. For the purposes of response paper one, I'm comfortable with you just indicating which option that you're responding to. That's totally fine. Um, but for future papers, specifically in the second half of the semester when we're talking about the research proposal, the lit review, and the final project, that's where having a title is going to be most relevant to us. But for now, it's okay if you want to just indicate which option you're responding to for your response paper. Um, if you want to take a stab at writing a title, that's also awesome. But I'm not necessarily expecting it in full robust form for this assignment. And then font type and size. Um, the only accepted font that meets MLA format in this class is Times New Roman. This font should be used for the essay, the header, the title, the page number, and the works cited page. This font should always be in 12 point, never a smaller or larger font size. If for accessibility reasons, it's easier for you to write your assignment in Calibri or Arial or another font style, that's totally fine. Just make sure that before you submit it, you hit the um, font style and change it to Times New Roman so that it is properly in the MLA format that you need, okay? Um, but it, I totally understand if you need to write in a different font style to get your assignment done, I definitely do that. Um, but just make sure that it's in Times New Roman by the time you turn it in to me. All right, so that is everything that I have for you today in English 2367. I so appreciate your patience, your understanding, your time with these lengthy lectures. I try to do my due diligence to give you a focus lecture each week that's going to cover the information that's most relevant and assistive for you to do well in the course. Again, I totally understand if you watch these lectures in parts where you do maybe a little 20 minutes here, 15 minutes here, maybe you watch it all together. Um, whichever method works the best for you, totally good by me. Just make sure that you're engaging with these focus lectures each week so that you get a sense of some of the things that are going to be really pertinent given that it is an accelerated course. Um, 
And I really try to make sure that each section of these lectures is robust to help you in case you're just struggling with or have questions about any of the material. As always, if you wanna talk with me beyond um, turning in your assignments, I'm so happy to do so. You are welcome to email me, visit me in virtual office hours. If my office hour times don't work with your schedule, I'm happy to establish a different appointment time with you. Basically, let me know how I can be of support to you. I really want to be, and I cannot express enough how happy and excited I am that you are in this class this summer. And my goal is that this is an enjoyable experience. And again, if any of the you know topics or issues covered in this class are confusing or you're unsure about them, and it would be beneficial for us to even just talk through them, I'm so happy to do that over email or in office hours, let me know how I can make sure that your learning experience is a supportive and safe environment, all right? So with many lighting changes happening at the time of me recording, this is me, Case Wizzle, signing off for English 2367, once again joined by my cat, Ferris Bueller. Thanks for your patience there as well. I look forward to seeing you in my week three overview lecture, and in the interim, visit me in office hours if you've got time on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Bye, everybody.